Hi church family, welcome to a Bible study about Romans chapter 12. We're going to go from Romans chapter 12, uh, 14 through to chapter 3, chapter 13, verse 5. And I'm at my home. It's a bit noisy because there's traffic outside and all sorts of things. Dogs barking and all sorts of things, but that's what makes it fun to have Bible study with me at home. And it's good to be with you. Good to see you, so to speak. And I pray that the Bible study in Romans will be meaningful and helpful and uh, will grow you understanding of the scripture. Now, this Bible study is not like a, a Bible study where we want to um, sort of choose a topic and then read about that topic and come up with ideas about that topic, which is probably the most exciting and interesting kind of Bible study. But this kind of Bible study where we look at a book of the Bible and we go passage by passage. Sometimes it's a bit like reading a commentary, and the work is up to you. To say, what are you saying to me, God, through this scripture passage today? What can I learn from it, and how can I put the lessons into action? So let's pray. Loving God, we pray that you'd help us in our study of your scriptures to know what it is that you have to say to us today, that we learn your ways and not ours, and that we'd grow in our, in our fellowship with you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll read from the message version of Romans chapter 12, verse 14 to uh, chapter 13, verse 5. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. I like that. Anyways, from Romans chapter 12, and just in brief summary, I'm not even going to do a presentation of this. We've gone from chapter 5 all the way through to chapter 12. And um, the general gist of that is that we, Paul has explained how we are saved and, and how it is through, through the grace of Jesus Christ. Then chapters, um, and, and also about this inward transformation, so that our, our attitudes and our 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 behavior changes completely because God is at work in us and transforming us. But now we get in from chapter 12 to the sort of practical application side. Now chapters 9 to 11 are a separate sort of section within Romans. Um, so you could actually jump from Romans chapter 8 through to 12 and you probably understand 12 better by just doing that and then coming back to 9 to 11 to understand the part where Paul speaks about anxiety about the the jews and their belonging to to the kingdom of god so romans 12 having just written about the importance of loving one another and being a church community that's full of forgiveness and grace uh, paul continues to write bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse now this is about life within the christian community the relationships between members of the church where there's Jews and Gentiles and people from different cultures and different uh, backgrounds, there's going to be a lot of division. And so instead of encouraging people to, to give each other a, a punch in the face, Paul encourages his church members to, to bless those who persecute and not curse them. Not only does he talk, is he talking about within the church, and I think that's part of the thing that we sometimes forget, is that Paul, you know, we say, let's go back to the early church and be like that early church as if it was this perfect community. And maybe it was wonderful when Jesus was the pastor of the 12 disciples. We might think that, but even then the treasurer um, was up to a bit of mischief and there was all sorts of division and people who wanted to be greater than the others. And I think that's recorded because they knew that the church would be a difficult place to be. Romans is about division in the church, about how Gentiles and Jews struggle to worship together and be in the same community together. 
And given the diversity of the community in those days and the difficulty of life, there would be a lot of division in this church that brought together Jews, Gentiles, people from all sorts of different backgrounds and invited them to worship God together. Beyond that, there was persecution from outside the church. And that also was something that people had to deal with. And so Christians are very different to any other tradition in the world at the time. Instead of cursing, they are to bless and to respond differently. Now, to bless someone is actually a beautiful thing. The, the word to bless is to eulogie, to ask God to bestow divine favor on somebody with the verbal with the implication that the oh, sorry i'm going in and out that the verbal act itself constitutes a significant benefit there was this understanding that the blessing that you would give to somebody else actually had a physical quality to it more than just uh, an act of 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 wishing somebody well but actually really truly giving them something good true blessing in Matthew chapter 5, also we remember what Jesus teaches us about loving our enemies. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You've heard that it was said, verse 43 of Matthew 5. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Now, that's also a very important scripture for us as Christians. As Methodists, uh, we talk about being perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we go to verse 48 there. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Because we place a huge emphasis on the importance of perfect love. And perfect love doesn't mean we do everything right, but we love with a sincere and pure heart and receive that purified heart from God himself. And the promise that Jesus says, if you are kind to your enemies, etc., you may be the sons of your father. Just as God gives the good gifts and you, you will reflect God's character. And this is what it's about, becoming like Jesus, becoming like God. Not only are you to bless those who persecute you and rejoice with those who rejoice, but you are to, uh, <laughs> anyways, but you are to rejoice with those who rejoice. And I think that's an important something that we need to make sure that we do, especially in this time of, of stress and this time of COVID, we might start feeling a little bit uh, unable to be happy for others, especially if you're going through a hard time. Rejoice with those who, who rejoice. Uh, Cairo, this state of happiness and well-being is a kind of state of generosity too, just sort of praying for others. And even Paul writes, although we are saddened, we are always rejoicing. This ability that we actually do have to be happy and sad at the same time, so to speak. And just for a laugh, I googled the, the, how to rejoice in other people's happiness. And the Huffington Post have, gave me an answer there proactively look for opportunities to shine a spotlight on somebody else so look for reasons to be grateful for others make a gratitude list be aware when you're jealous and this other idea of fake it till you make it so it says that we must have sincere love but sometimes our sincere love also needs to be expressed in saying we're so proud of you because we know in our head that we are and emotionally we're still catching up and start with the people you love, the ones that it's easy to, to enjoy their successes. But you, know, you might actually learn to enjoy the successes even of your enemy. And then uh, work your way up to dealing with the hard stuff. With practice, you'll be able to take on more sensitive issues. I just thought that was something helpful. Rejoice with those who rejoice, but also mourn with those who mourn. And this is really expressive mourning. The, the word for mourning evokes the image of people who were called to come and, and, and weep at funerals. They were actually employed to be extra weepers, to, to make an, an extra racket. And that was the culture of the time. But you're invited not to just um, sort of feel oh, shame. 
but actually to 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 weep with those who are weeping to to struggle with those who are having a difficult and uh first corinthians chapter 12 verse 25 reminds us one member suffers all suffer together with it if one member is honored all rejoice together with it and isn't that true if you've got a sore back uh it's like the rest of your body struggles with it and as paul writes about us being one body the church he is reminding us to 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 know that if somebody's had a victory or somebody's rejoicing or happy then we are all happy together yeah live in harmony with one another do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position do not be conceited i like this turn of phrase that we should live in harmony with one another and be humble uh, and humility is also an interesting characteristic i skipped that in my slide just jumped ahead there's something behind behind this that i also want to talk about but humility was an interesting concept in in the time in which paul was writing people weren't uh, usually humble the jews had this virtue of being humble but the Greeks and Romans saw humility as weakness. So you were humble if you were a servant or if you were a nobody, but it was you were kind of expected to boast a bit about yourself. Humility was a countercultural attitude, a thing that people were encouraged to have that was different to everybody else. So be humble and take it on you. Back to this one. Proud. No, that's before your patience for the journey with us. Ah, that's what I want to talk about. Living in harmony with one another. And uh, some people, uh, in some translations, have the same mind as each other or think the same. And uh, groupthink is an extremely dangerous kind of thing. Church is not meant to be a place where everybody has the same opinion or the same idea. We're meant to disagree with one another, but we're meant to agree within, within the purpose. So the, the root word there is about thoughtful planning or intentions, not and about an attitude, but not necessarily about the ideas that you have and the things that you, that you think upon. And it just made me think of uh, him i love about the church but it always makes me wonder when it says in verse in verse four of this hymn of charles wesley even now we think and speak the same and cordially agree consented all through jesus name in perfect harmony it's a lovely image especially as the church sings and we're saying we think the same but let's not think that we think and speak the same as as kind of a an boring unity but rather an interesting diversity and celebrating our diversity as the greatest gifts that we have for one another and if we're humble we'll enjoy having people who are different because we'll discover that we learn a lot from those who are different to us so live in harmony with one another do not be proud associate with people of low position and conceited that's another thing about the church is that you belong by invitation and the host is jesus and he invites anybody and everybody to join and so people wouldn't have liked the idea of being part of a a group of people who would have um would have consisted of slaves free people rich people poor and in this case each is meant to be part of the other and if they follow the jewish tradition of a tithe then other groups might have asked for a certain fee so you could have kept the poor out made something for rich people and poor people in this case if you gave proportionally anybody could belong as long as they gave their portion so we continue thinking about this about living in harmony with people and we see that the emphasis from christ's perspective from the from from the perspective here in romans is that we put ourselves second so that others can be first and we live in this attitude of learning rather than always putting our ideas across before anybody. Do not repay back. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And uh, 
this is a beautiful line from first peter chapter 3 verse 9 um do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse but on the contrary repay with a blessing it is for this that you were called that you might inherit a blessing so there's two things i think that peter points to us being created for the one is that we might inherit a blessing and the other one is that we could repay with a blessing so no matter what evil we receive no matter how badly people might treat us no matter how difficult life might be made for you by them, you bless because you know that in god you will inherit a blessing you are blessed to be blessing you have that that gift from god Paul goes on to say that we should be careful to uh, do what is right in the eyes of everybody. So does that mean that we need to do what's most popular? Um, I'm not sure that it does, but I think he is reminding us to remember that as Christians we shine the light of Christ wherever we go, and it's up to us to do the best we can, to do right as far as so, and I like the different translation of, of being at peace with one another as we go on to verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that's a different translation, but this, uh, live peaceably with all. Wouldn't you like to have a peaceable life, to be known as a peaceable person? Not just peaceful, peaceable, able to make peace, able to live in peace and share your peace with others. And you need to live in a place of peace to be able to do that. So you need to draw strength from God. Do not take revenge, says Paul, uh, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. That's also an important thing. As Christians, we know that we belong to God, we belong to Christ, and so it's God's business, Christ's business, to get revenge if there's any need to get revenge. And then this verse that Paul quotes from verse 20 on is uh, also quoted in the Psalms. Psalm 25. If your enemies are hungry, give them bread to eat. And if they are thirsty, give them water to drink. For you will heap Coals of fire on their heads, and the Lord will reward you. And really what it's talking about is pricking the conscience of those who are horrible to you, those who are your enemies, and if you're good to them, they will hopefully be, be um, convicted in their conscience. But also there's this promise of God's reward and God's punishment that those who treat you with injustice will receive um, God's justice in the end, and that you trust god for god's justice you never know what somebody's going through why they treat you the way they do you don't know how you've affected others so you trust god to put things it doesn't mean that you just are a pushover and let anybody do anything or say anything about you but that you give it to god i just um i laugh at verse 24 which is just typical proverbs kind of stuff old school it is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a contentious wife. Sure, it's better to live in the corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a contentious husband, too. But uh, just talking about being peaceable and giving God, God the grace, uh, just the attitude that we can have in the way that we live with one another, so that we're not contentious husbands, or wives, or children, or parents, but rather that we help there to be peace in a way that is good and healthy, not just being a, a doormat, but being a healthy kind of peace for all the people that we live with. That brings us to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Be a good citizen, says uh, the message translation. All governments are under God, insofar as there is peace and order, it's God's order. So live responsibly as a citizen. You're irresponsible to the state. If you're irresponsible to the state, then you're irresponsible with it. And God will hold you responsible. 
Duly constituted authorities are only a threat if you're trying to get by with something. Decent citizens should have nothing here. Do you want to be on good terms with the government? Be a responsible citizen and you'll get on. The government working to your advantage. But if you're breaking the rules, right and left, watch out. The police aren't just there to be admired in their uniforms. God also has an interest in keeping order and he uses them to do it. That's why you must live responsibly. Not just to avoid punishment, but also because it's the right way to live. That's also why you pay taxes, so that an orderly way of life can be maintained. Fulfill your obligations as a citizen. Pay your taxes, pay your bills, respect your leaders. I like the way Peterson turns it around. And I think this is an important passage, and why Paul is writing about this is because at the time, the Christians were known as a bit of a kind of rebel group, and they were drawing attention to themselves because they weren't conforming to the ways of the world. They weren't um, making sacrifices to, to the normal gods. They weren't doing the normal religion. There was something novel in you. There was room in the Roman Empire for a diversity. The Romans recognized the importance of letting people have their religion because they could be more productive and the Commonwealth could become more wealthy. They didn't really understand monotheism and being only able to worship one God and not call Caesar Lord, but only call Jesus Lord. So that made life difficult for the Christians. On top of that, Christians who knew that God had forgiven their sin could quite easily become arrogant and, you know, we could walk around saying, well, I'm a child of God. And uh, sometimes when you see the sign on the back of a taxi, only God can forgive me, um, reminds you that, um, that we can't take our relationship with God as an excuse to get away with all sorts of nonsense. Beyond that, the scriptures do not teach blind obedience and submission to governing authorities. And that's very important. We've been reading in, in Exodus about the rebellion of Shipra and Pua. So um, this is one commentary which, which impresses the need to be, um, to be obedient to the authorities instituted by God and sometimes... Uh, and even points out that sometimes he institutes evil rulers as a means of trial or judgment. And we read in Second Chronicles and in the Old Testament, sometimes these evil kings were brought up and it said in the scriptures that they were there to bring judgment. But if we read about other people like um, Daniel and also about Shipra and Pua, who would be uh, rebellious So from Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, but the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. They let the boys live. And so there is an importance to be submit, submissive to the authorities, but only as far as God allow it. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And we need to be reminded at the same time, talk about that, about the um, importance of, of authorities taking responsibility for their power. So as much as we must be obedient and we must be good citizens and peaceable people, if you are somebody with power, remember the things that Jesus said. You know, if you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better if you had a great millstone tied around your neck and you were drowned in the sea. Uh, and then parables that Jesus tells, like this one in Matthew chapter 21, uh, from verse 34, speaking about the wicked tenants who took over the vineyard and they, they abused their privilege and what kind of judgment would come upon them if God could have his way. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. You want to be free from fear of the one in authority, then do what is right, and he will come. Again, like I'm saying, the people, the Christians, especially the, the, the Jewish and Gentile Christians, probably had a really hard time with the authorities in Rome. 
different. They would have been regarded as as outcasts and outsiders, and you could easily build up resentment for those in authority and just rebel for the sake of rebelling. But Paul reminds us to to be peaceable citizens and to do what we are meant to do as far as we are meant to do it. And reminds us that those people in authority, as difficult as their job is, they are God's servants to do you good. And you should be afraid if you do wrong. Uh, and that sometimes the ruling authorities are God's agents. And uh, sometimes when you do wrong, you actually need to face the music. Hand yourself over to the authorities. Whatever it is you need to do, uh, because um, not because of possible punishment, but because of and this is also why you pay taxes for the authorities of God's servants give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. Pay taxes, pay taxes. Revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. It's a Christian obligation to pay what's right. And although there are many corrupt officials in government, there are many government employees who actually put in a very honest day's work for a very reasonable way. And serve the community the problem is that these wage bills get inflated and lots of corruption and all those kinds of mix-ups and uh, we're talking about billions of rands that could have gone to the, the poor in our country that have gone elsewhere we need to talk about reasonable lives reasonable people so that um, everybody's paid what they what they deserve and they earn what they deserve but we all pay our taxes in order to make sure that we can can be a, a reasonable community and so i pray that we would be good christian citizens obedient submissive where we need to be and a good christian community that lives in harmony with one another caring for one another willing to be humble for the sake of others so that each of us could become and be the people that we are called to be so I pray that you would be blessed in the week ahead. And thanks for listening to this as we've read from Romans 12 to 13. And we continue with Romans 13 next week, same time. Be blessed.